Hello, my name is Nadia Denton. I'm a film curator based in London. On behalf of CineDB Insights, I introduce this interview, which is part of the CineDB Africa Conversation Series, a collection of in-depth encounters with film professionals from across the African continent. CineDB Africa, supported by the Gotha Institute, now has a new home on the e-portal of the Devon Film Art Institute. Today, I am joined by Shivani Pandya Malhotra, Managing Director of the Red Sea International Film Festival. Welcome, Shivani. Thank you, Nadia. Nice to be here, and it'll be, it's nice to be chatting with you. Please tell us about the Red Sea International Film Festival and how African filmmakers can best engage with it. So the Red Sea International Film Festival is now in its second year. So we're very, very young, but uh, we have great ambitions and we really want to be a destination and platform for the region. And when I'm talking about the region, I'm talking about the Arab world. Uh, I'm talking about Africa and Asia. Um, at the moment, we've really been focusing on the Arab world and Africa. We've started doing more um, and uh, we have diff we have different uh, elements across the festival. We have obviously the festival where we are showcasing films. We have a competition. The competition is inclusive of African films, so it's Asia, Africa, and the Arab world. Um, we also have uh, various other programs where we are inclusive of films from all around the world. So last year we showcased 143 films with uh, approximately representing about 66 different countries. So it's a very it's a global film festival, and um, having said that, the competition focuses both for features as well as short films, so this is for the three territories that I mentioned. Um, and then we also have a lot of different industry programs. We have the Red Sea Souk, which is uh, essentially the film market. Um, it's our film market that's focusing on uh, the region as well as being a platform for international filmmakers and business people to come in. Um, the idea and objective is that we eventually become a destination for anybody seeking content in the Arab world, in the African world, and Asia. And that would be the ultimate goal. We're very, very young, so we're just starting out and doing it in small phases. So the souk itself has different programs. I mean, you know, we typically we have an exhibition area. So if there are, you know, companies, institutions, film commissions that want to be represented there, they can come and take a hoop. So we have, you know, that's an opportunity. Uh, we also just have accreditation. People can come and get accreditation. And uh, we had last year, we had over 4,000 industry delegates that were present. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to meet everybody from the Arab world. And a lot of people that come down from Europe, uh, the US and other countries uh, that are looking at content from our regions. Uh, we also have you know things like panel discussions, workshops that take place. But more importantly, we have a project market um, and the project market, we have, uh, we pick up uh, handpicked projects, uh, which represent uh, projects from the Arab and African world. Um, so there's a great opportunity. I think last year we had uh, five different projects out of 16 that were cho chosen from the soup, in, from the film market side uh, that were from Africa. And um, we are looking at now opening up submissions. So instead of us handpicking, uh, we will. We hope to open up submissions where everybody has an opportunity to actually submit uh, their projects. So that's that's the second element uh, that we have. Then we have the Red Sea Labs. Uh, within the labs, there are lots of different programs where we're looking at educating. Uh, we're looking at helping uh, filmmakers and uh, you know mentoring them across their project. Um, so we have the Red Sea Lodge, which is in conjunction with Torino. It's an eight month uh, residency program. Uh, where we select the uh, projects from the Arab world, from Saudi. And this year, we've also included African projects. So we're very, very excited. We haven't made the decision on the projects yet. Uh, the committee is currently reviewing it, uh, but it was open and we did get a fair a number of submissions from Africa. Then similarly, we've got the Red Sea Fund. Uh, the Red Sea Fund is an avenue where different projects can apply for funding at different stages. Um, so it's literally across the life cycle of filmmaking. So we've got 
uh, you can you know you can submit for development money, you can submit for uh, production, you can submit for post production. Um, and we have four cycles a year, which uh, start out at post production, which has started that which we have opened up now uh, in February. Then we'll have another round uh, which will open up for development projects in April. In June, we'll open up for production. And then in August, we'll open up again for post-production. Um, so there's a host of uh, opportunities for different filmmakers to apply, and this is completely open to uh, Africa. In the last two years of uh, operations, I think we've seen a few African projects come through, uh, but I do believe there's more, now more word of mouth. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, with institutions like yours and various others, that we can spread the word that we are open and we have, uh, you know, committees that are reviewing projects and objectively select making selections uh, that eventually get funding from our fund. That's excellent. A really thorough overview, um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and I just wanted to pick your brains about the industry aspect, the SOOC, which I think is a brilliant um uh, and title uh, for the actual activity. What kind of practical advice would you give to filmmakers about engaging? I'm thinking more about the industry-led events. So obviously we're in the season at the moment of international uh, industry markets. Just based on your experience in the industry, what do you think are some of the practical things that filmmakers should consider when wanting to engage with industry professionals such as yourselves, yourself rather, at, at markets like this? So I think one of the key key elements is uh, you know really identifying when people are attending a particular market, identifying what is it that they want to achieve out of it. Is it just pure networking? Do they have a project in mind that they're looking at going into production? Are they looking at financing? Um, so I always feel that it's great to look at the schedule, uh, you know, prior to coming into a festival, and also reach out to the industry people. Most markets have a database or have a directory uh, where you can see who's coming. Fernando is a great tool. Uh, you know, so once you know who's uh, attending a particular market and you want to reach out to them, whatever the reason might be, um, it's important to schedule meetings in advance. Uh, I just feel that uh, marketplaces are great opportunities uh, for networking, for pitching your project, meeting with people, um, and you never know, you know, you might meet somebody today with, uh, even if it's a networking section, uh, you know, a session or a cocktail, and that person you might, you know, connect with, and then at, late, at a later stage, that person sort of helps you out or you work together. And it's uh, it's very important to go for these because it gives you an insight and makes you, be, you know, stay in touch with what the latest, uh, you know, whatever the latest trends are, what's happening. Uh, in the industry, what uh, sales agents or what the platforms might be looking for when they're picking up a project. Super. And you've alluded to the fact um, that uh, obviously Saudi Arabia is now sort of opening up in terms of having more of a film presence. And, you know, the festival is, you know, positioning itself to be one of the key uh, film destinations in the region. Um, what else can you say about, uh, you know, engagement with Saudi Arabia and filmmakers uh, traveling to Saudi, um, that might just be helpful because of course a lot of us are not really so familiar necessarily um, with, you know, um, international travel there. And clearly there's been a lot of sort of negative press about the country in terms of foreigners, you know, um, engaging with the culture. So, I, you know, it was, I've been living in Dubai for, in the UAE, just next door to Saudi for the longest time. And I knew very little about it till it opened up in 2018. And uh, literally neighbors and, you know, met a few Saudis here. Um, but when I went in there, it was quite a revelation. I met the most enthusiastic, young uh, filmmakers and creative people. And uh, it was just overwhelming to see how they were all wanting to do things and hadn't had an opportunity because uh, the laws were different at that point in time. And, you know, music was not allowed. You could not watch films in public. You didn't have cinema theaters. Um, you know, so there were women couldn't drive at one point. But all of that has changed in five years. It's changed rapidly. Um, and that change when you it's it's been almost organic. It's been really fast. And you see everybody adapting and you see the youngsters sort of molding into this new Saudi that we see today. 
Um, and it's been very refreshing. It's been very exciting for somebody like me, which is, you know, we've, we've discovered a whole lot of creative people we haven't uh, met before who are, you know, who are creating great products. The um the government is doing as much as they can to help enable. So they've created different, you know, the Ministry of Culture and all different organizations and institutions are supporting the industry. Um, so all, apart from that, we also have the private sector that's investing quite a lot. Um, so what we've seen as a result is, you know, exhibition theaters. So you weren't allowed to see films uh, till five years back uh, in a collective manner. Um, so, but today, you know, you have over 300 screens uh, that are there by 2030. They're looking at 2,500 screens being built. Uh, you're looking at a box office, which is uh, the largest in the Middle East and probably Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they're predicting that uh, the box office will be $1 billion by 2030. Today, it's at about 238 million uh, US dollars in 2022. So we're seeing, we're seeing a huge change. It's, um, you know, there's uh, a fair amount of uh, content that's required with the increase in theaters. We're seeing uh, there's a dearth of Arab content, there's a dearth of uh, good content coming out from the region itself. So there's an opportunity there. Um, I think for, you know, also with respect for people coming in from outside, I feel soon there will be ability to do more co-productions with the Arab world. I think that's something everybody's open to. Um, also, what's very interesting is that uh, they have a 40% rebate. Uh, that's uh, been announced by the commissions, by the, the Saudi Film Commission, and they're encouraging international productions to come and shoot uh, in Saudi. Um, so I think it'll be a few years uh, where all the infrastructure will be ready. I know they're setting up studios. Uh, they're making it more conducive uh, for productions to take place. Um, so I really hope that over the next few years, we'll see more core productions, maybe from Africa and from other parts of the world. Uh, today, there are already some uh, productions that are taking place between other countries from the Arab world and Saudi uh, with respect to co-productions. And we've had a few international films that have also been shot. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot a lot happening. And um, I think also financially, the institutions that have been set up uh, that are supporting and funding uh, both private and, uh, you know, governmental uh, institutions that are supporting films coming out uh, of the region. Yeah, I mean, that's so encouraging. And it's really great to, you know, hear about the flowering and, you know, the emergence of, um, you know, new territories um, like Saudi Arabia. Um, I've certainly been in informed that they have a very young uh, population. They have one of the sort of growing and um, largest youth populations in the region. So that's also interesting um, in terms of thinking about future audiences. So on that subject of co-productions, what in your own sort of, I suppose, personal and even artistic opinion, what kind of content and narratives do you think that the Arab world would like to see from Africa or that you think could work particularly well for Saudi audiences? Oh, I think that's that's a really difficult, uh, difficult one because um, I, I, I feel that if somebody is making, you know, content that is authentic, the stories are good. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example. You have um, Korean content that does extremely well. K-pop culture does extremely well in Saudi. And who knew, you know, um, Japanese anime works really well in the region. Like everybody loves it. So it's very interesting to see how, and these were not made for the Saudi audiences. These were not made for the Arab audiences. You know, these were stories, authentic stories that were recreated and told uh, for people's own local population and uh, audiences. And it was just, you know, the quality, the layering of storytelling, um, the quality of productions that appealed and it, it traveled. And I really feel that if you make a good film, you may have a good story. You don't have to try to appeal or make it for somebody else. It has to be authentic to, you know, whatever you're trying to tell. And if you do that and you do it really well, I truly believe that your film will travel. So, you know, I think it's true for anybody. And I feel I've, I've seen uh, a fair amount. You also have, you know, Indian cinema, Bollywood, which is again made for, you know, an Indian population is really almost a genre, um, and that 
that's traveled. And, you know, that was not created for any other audiences. It was created for its own Indian audiences. So it's been quite interesting. And I think what's been nice is that, in the, you know, they, they are open to different cultures and uh, different content coming through. So if they're good stories coming in from Africa, I'm sure, you know, it'll be, it'll be it's only a matter of time that people will start uh, watching it and gets more popular. That's brilliant. So, so good to hear. Lastly, do you have any film industry predictions for 2023 or are there any patterns or trends that you will believe will become more pronounced um, as relates to the industry? In the period ahead. So I, I, you know, I think you know it's the it's the the situation is we've all been talking about what happens post COVID, and um, while we're seeing cinemas come back slowly in our part of the world, um, especially in Saudi, cinemas are growing. But having said that, so is you know so are the people watching uh, you know content at home. So the OTT platforms um are also sort of you know they've got uh, more they've got more people ever you know than ever before sort of subscribing to content so i feel as a result of having these different avenues uh i believe independent filmmaking is you know got a lot of potential because there's so many different avenues where you could showcase your content so it's not only about theatrical release you can be smart about creating productions that are not very expensive you can tell your story uh, with tighter budgets um, and, uh, you know, hopefully get some of the platforms, get some of the uh, digital, um, uh, just get them showcased on, you know, whether it's uh, Netflix, whether it's Amazon and, you know, with whoever you've got uh, within your country. Sometimes there are lots of local uh, other television stations that are doing digital uh, platforms and buying content. So there is really a huge amount of opportunity. And I feel the other element that I've seen, which is quite interesting, is that short films are doing really well. So I feel that people are now sort of, you know, really enjoying watching uh, shorter content. Uh, and you see that in the form of, you know, people watching whether they're watching series or episodic. Um, and you also see, I, we, we've seen at the festival, short films get consumed uh, and are the first ones to sell out. So it's really interesting. And I think the youth probably maybe have a shorter attention span and want to see uh, consume films. I don't know what the reason is, but it's it's great to see that short films are being well received. Um, so I, I I really feel that the independent filmmaker have a huge amounts of opportunity, and you know they shouldn't stop. They should tell their story. Um, they should look at different avenues. There's also you know different ways of funding. I'm seeing more and more individual institutions and organizations come up. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of the platforms support independent filmmaking. Um, even if, you know, a lot of the platforms might be American, uh, but when they're coming into the different regions, they're looking at regional content. Um, so I really feel there's an opportunity for everyone. And I think we should all capitalize on it and try and make the most of it um, and see how we can tell our stories. <laughs> Music to my ears. I couldn't agree more. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you today, Shivani. Very grateful for all of the information you've shared. It's been quite educational to understand how Saudi has opened up and, you know, even for African filmmakers watching this to think about collaborations with the Arab world. Um, at the top of the interview, you mentioned a number of initiatives and ways in which filmmakers could potentially be in touch. So can I just confirm, is there like a contact page? What's the best way um, in terms of people who might have watched this and they want to reach out and, you know, make some initial connections? What would you advise? So I would suggest that you track our updates on our website, which is redseafilmfest.com. Uh, and uh, also we're very active on social media. So if you follow us at Red Sea Film um, on uh, Instagram, there's a lot, all our announcements. Every time we're opening up for any of the programs, it's all announced there. So that's really a good way uh, for people to see uh, what's happening and uh, they can always get onto our website and get the details. Brilliant. Uh, thank you so much. Perfect. All right. Lovely speaking to you. And you too. Thank you.